So this is a cash flow projection spreadsheet that we put together. And this, this uh, spreadsheet would apply in general to any business. And yeah, if you're sitting at the back, you're going to want to move up because I can only make the font so big on a spreadsheet. Um, so the idea with this spreadsheet is we wanted to make it as fast as possible for you to be able to kind of run some different business scenarios when you're getting going and thinking and you know, saying, how many techs do I need to hire? What kind of inventory do I need to have? Uh, and so I'm going to like very quickly walk you through this, but then this spreadsheet is available for free online. This is a Google Doc template that you can copy, and there's also an Excel file you can download. Uh, and then I'll, I'll show you some other resources that we put together as part of this as well. So uh, the idea here, we'll start out and we'll say, okay, this is my repair shop. Um, this, you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to customize this because my name is not Jeff. Oh, it's, it thinks I'm offline. Let me see. See if I have internet. Nope. All right. Um, it's not going to let me make changes. So this is initially starting out saying, you know, this is the name of my shop, and this is my uh, markup and what I think I can charge for repair. So this is running around a retail repair business, but you can certainly change it however you want. And then uh, building in your uh, general income tax rate. Um, your, you know, whatever credit card fees you're paying, and let me, let me change this so that I can see without looking backwards. Okay. Credit card fees, um, how much money you're going to need to start up, how much you're anticipating paying that back if you have to pay it back, if you're borrowing the money from your parents or something. Uh, how much uh, your warranty is going to cost you, and this, this number dramatically impacts bottom line, and then Say, okay, what kind of tools do I need to set up? So this is assuming that you're going to buy all of your expensive things from iFixit because we want all your money. Um, pointing out, you know, so here's some initial marketing costs. Maybe you want to join your local chamber of commerce. So we've got about, um, about $700 in kind of initial um, office supply type stuff. And then here's an initial inventory for kind of a variety. So we've got some laptop drives and some iPhone. And so this is kind of a, a general small repair shop. So we're estimating here about $2,900 in upfront inventory for a kind of minimal supply of parts. And then office supplies. So we've got kind of a $3,500 initial uh, setup cost. And you can see that's basically the loan. So we're going to take out a loan to start our business that's going to be about the same, uh, same amount of money we need to invest in initial equipment. And then I, I set it up so here is uh, some of the different repair services that you can offer. And the more that you can productize your repair services, the better. So cost of goods sold, uh, what I'm going to sell the part for, how much billable time uh, parts cost. And then this kind of allows you to, and you can, you can see the formula here. This is not particularly sophisticated math. This is take, take how much you're selling it for and subtract your cost of part and your cost of labor, and that's your profit. So profit per unit there. And then uh, sa basic sales projection. So this is, you know, month one. I'm going to do five of these uh, repairs, and then over time, I'm going to ramp it up. And then, you know, maybe a year out, I'm doing I'm doing 25 of these these repairs a month. That's pretty exciting business. Uh, and then also, uh, this then takes so any of the green cells are are cells that you can edit, and then the white cells down here are uh, calculations. So this is uh, how much revenue you're doing repairing iPhone 4S displays over time. And this is the simulation you're going to have to fill out with your own numbers. And then uh, parts costs, so what your, your part outlay is, uh, your labor costs if you're, if you're paying people. In this case, um, we're, I think the, the labor cost on those is not factored in. And then your overall gross profit broken down by parts. So you can see over time if I go if I go a few years out, like it's, it's good for me to have kind of a mix of different repairs that I'm doing. Now, what this doesn't take into account, and you're going to have to realize if you're actually building a three-year business plan, you're probably not going to be fixing iPhone 4S screens three years out. You're going to be repairing something else, but that can be a proxy in there. OK. Um, projected income. So this is the bottom line, how much money I'm making off of this. Uh, add in your additional expenses. So uh, I'm assuming that you're running out of your basement for a good long while, so rent is free. <laughs> And then over time, you say, OK, maybe a year, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my own shop. So that's costing me $500 a month. Um, 
and you know some additional you know real expenses you can factor in. And in, <laughs> in the case of Ivan, yeah, he's like, yeah, you moved up from the basement to the kitchen. <laughs> That's your 500 bucks a month. This is a very, uh, I mean, you're, these numbers are all small because this is uh, 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 you know entry level projection. When we were doing this, we were we were uh, helping people plan repair businesses that were doing everything from running small repair businesses in Africa to doing. Um, to doing, you know, like full, uh, you know, shops here, and so we wanted numbers that weren't com going to completely scare the Africans away. <laughs> All right, and then you say, okay, how much, is, you know, am I going to hire anybody? And then uh, if you're paying them eight dollars an hour, don't just it don't cost you a lot more than eight dollars an hour, so you can kind of put in your overhead. Generally for us, uh, and I fix it, it's between twenty and twenty-three percent overhead in California with the workers' comp insurance and everything else. So that's your cost per hour, and then you can kind of factor in like this is a good way of you know bring estimate the number of uh, hours per per month you've got each of them in there, and then what's what they're going to cost you. This is assuming, by the way, that you're not having to hire somebody full time and pay them. That you can actually ramp up your hours as you ramp up your your uh, sales, which is a very good thing to try to do. And then if this loads, is the chart not going to load without internet? There's a pretty graph, I swear. Oh. I guess this was sort of inevitable at this point in the day that we would. Yeah. To get internet, yeah. What I should have done was paid the dollar a day. I'm too cheap. All right, well, I, maybe I'll, uh, while we do the breakout sessions, I'll see if I can get the internet going, and then I'll show you. Um, since I happen to load this page, let me just show you one other thing real quick. Um, so this, I, I, and I will show you where you can get this, this cash flow projection. Um, but the idea was pretty much anybody who goes through the process of planning a business is going to do something like this. Maybe you're not going to go to this much detail. But the hope is that this is something you can sit down in, in half an hour plug in enough kind of basic assumptions into the green cells in the spreadsheet to give your, yourself a feel of where you're going. Uh, and the probably the number one mistake that I have seen people make when they're starting new businesses, not just repair businesses, businesses in general, is things are going along, you're starting to sell things, you're like, oh gee, it's certainly a hassle not having enough parts, I'd like to go out and buy more parts. And you end up accidentally ending up with too much inventory. Uh, and you can actually completely be, you can be making money, you can happily be profitable, run out of cash and go out of business. This happens to restaurants all the time. You wonder why restaurants fail, it's because they're awful at managing inventory and they, they get really excited, they find a whole bunch of meat that looks really good, they buy a ton of it and then they don't have money to make payroll. So uh, you got to watch your cash flow really carefully and I'm not going to do a full accounting class right now, but uh, we put this tool together as a, as a way to help you uh, run through some of the, those examples. And the fantastic thing about a spreadsheet is it's not a big deal to change numbers around and run a bunch of different scenarios. So I highly recommend try a few different scenarios. What happens if I hire a tech six months in? What happens if I do it myself and burn the midnight oil and, and manage to you know, build up a, a significant cash uh, a reserve before I go in and want to want to grow? And you can kind of finesse and, and you'll realize that you actually have a lot of control over how fast you want your business to grow. How much do I want to invest in marketing? Do I want to hire a, you know, a, a college intern to go out and you know, go on Facebook and Twitter or whatever? Like th there's uh, huge options in front of you and you just kind of have to, have to make the decision based on the bottom line. What's that? Oh, you think so? Hey, it fixed itself. Okay, well, let me show you the, go. The chart will magically appear, I swear. We'll try this. Hey, it's a graph, okay. All right, so this chart, if I can go down to where we can see the key. All right, so the green here, this is your gross sales. Uh, pink is your expenses, and then um, red is your monthly profit, and uh, black is your cumulative cash flow. So black here, this is the amount of money you have. You can see at month four, we basically run out of money. So that, that's probably bad. <laughs> 
Because if in your scenario you are running out of money, even though I'm sitting here and I'm like, hey, sales are going up and up and up, I, you know, I'm reasonably happy, and you're on the you know, on the stream. Well, you're never gonna get to month five if you run out of money here. And then you start saying, okay, well, I'll put it on credit cards. And putting inventory on credit cards is a really bad idea because inventory is depreciating anyway. If you've got inventory, it's expensive. It's going to lose. Your parts are going to lose value over time. You're paying the bank 25% interest on it. If you have increase in inventory at the end of the year, you have to pay taxes on the increase. So let's say you went and last year you had $5,000 in inventory December 31st. This year you have $10,000 in inventory December 31st. You took $5,000 of your money, you put it into inventory. You've got it, it's sitting there on the shelf. You can look at it, you say, hey, look, there's my $5,000. The IRS comes and says, oh, gee, it looks like you made $5,000. You're like, no, no, I didn't make it, it's sitting on the shelf. And the IRS says, we don't care, we want taxes on that $5,000 that you made because you can't prove to us that that's actually there. So if your tax rate is 30%, now you're saying, oh, gee, on this $5,000 in inventory, I gotta come up with another $2,000 in taxes. So that increased $5,000 in inventory actually cost you $7,000 by the time you're done. And then you had it sitting on your shelf, so maybe it went down in value. Maybe it cost you more like eight or $9,000. Inventory is very, very expensive. Be, go into that uh, with, with uh, your head in the game. Uh, I mean, you've got a bit of an advantage in that the cost of your inventory is lower because they're products that you're buying and you're scavenging, but you're still doing everything you can to minimize the amount that you have. Electronics recyclers, I mean, know the cost of inventory well, but uh, I mean, you can get parts cheaper, so that's, that's also an advantage that you have. But if you're going out there, I mean, you're doing these mobile device repairs, uh, the cost of the parts is very, very significant. The other thing is the farther away that you get from when you bought the parts, the harder it's going to be to collect your warranty on it from whoever sold you the shitty parts in the first place. So this goes back to how good the parts do you want to buy, who are you buying them from, and then how much leash do you really want to give them before you actually install and test the part. Okay, that's my rant on inventory. Um, I, I, I say this because I have, had, I have a friend who runs a business called SparkFun. They do... Uh, uh, they make circuit boards and Arduinos and all these cool components. And they were happily running along. They were like in their sixth year, very profitable. They were doing over $20 million in revenue. And they screwed up their spreadsheet doing inventory calculations and they actually bought twice as much inventory as they meant to. And they ran out of money and almost went out of business. And if, if he hadn't been able to get an emergency line of credit, he would have been done and put 50 people out of business. Easy, easy mistake to make. Just whoops. <laughs> whoops, bought too much inventory, I'm done. So uh, now that the horror stories are behind me, um, I want to just show you. This is a, our iPad Air Teardown. Uh, this is step by step through the process. Uh, you can see this is the edit link on every step. So if I want to go and make a change to this, I can do that. And this is uh, contributing that I fix it. You can just tap and suggest a change to anything. Anybody can do this. You don't have to be logged in. Uh, and if I want to go in and say, well, gee, I was just doing this and I broke it. You can go in and you can add a, a caution note. You can also, actually, it's very easy to add a call out. So I can, I can add circles uh, and markers to, to images. So we, we did, wanted to make a, a process that was super, super streamlined for creating new technical documentation. As a matter of fact, if you have an Android device, you can take pictures right on your phone and add them to the app or add them to the guide. So you can be on a guide, say hit edit, take a picture of the the repair that you're doing in front of you and throw it up on the repair guide it takes five seconds. It's awesome. That's just because I love all of you. OK. The, the other thing I wanted to show, and this is Jeff gets credit for most of this, uh, the business toolkit that we've done has a tremendous amount of online resources. And this is, uh, this is thanks. Microsoft funded the development of this. Uh, we haven't released this yet, so you guys are the first to see it. And we're going to email the link to this because it's unpublished. So we'll send a link to this to all of you. Uh, John has been helping us prototype it. So this goes through in detail everything that we're going through in this course. So if you want to start a repair business, you can click here. And we're going to walk you through. And we're going to talk a little bit about the materials that we have available. What do you want to get, do to get started? So let's say, first thing you say when you want to start a new repair business is, what should I repair? So we have a bunch of ideas for you. Replacing batteries in MacBooks, upgrading the RAM and iMacs, uh, doing PC repairs, here's some. And then each of these repairs actually links in. So this is a PS3 repair that you can do. This links into the actual step-by-step -step procedure. Uh, links to you know, troubleshooting, game consoles. And then there's also there's a, 
there's a comment section where people can talk about what sort of things have worked for you. So I'd love to see all of you contributing and commenting on this. In addition to uh, you know, the basic start of business, we've also got, um, we put together a bit of a code of ethics that we thought would be useful for repair technicians. And I would be very interested in hearing what all of you have to say about this. But uh, basic, basic principles, be honest, uh, be honest, be, have integrity in your advertising, uh, take care of client data, data. Uh, have a commitment to environmental responsibility, which if you're in R2 and e storage, you're forced to do that, but I think everybody in the industry should be, uh, and, then, and then respect the law, and that's sort of the basics, and then we go into some more details. But what we're trying to do with all of this is raise the bar for the repair industry as a whole so that it's a better alternative for consumers than going and buying new things. We've got some information on setting up repair workspaces, uh, which I'm not necessarily going to go into. We also uh, partnered with a, a little company called O'Reilly Publishing. They make uh, PC, uh, well, they, they make computer books of all kinds. If you know, if you go into Barnes and Noble and you see the books with the animals on the cover, that's O'Reilly. We went and we looked at all the PC repair books that were out there on the marketplace, and we said, what's the absolute best PC repair book? or most comprehensive. The most comprehensive repair book is the PC Repair Bible. It's in its like 23rd edition and it's 1300 pages and it's way too detailed. If you want the pinout of a floppy drive, it is in this book. None of you want the pinout of a floppy drive. So he said, okay, this book is too crazy. What's another book that maybe is, is underrated or, or was underrepresented? It turned out that O'Reilly had a really good upgrading and repairing PC book that, they, that was a, a edition or two old um, and they hadn't gotten around to updating, and, but it was actually really well written. And so I went to O'Reilly and I said, hey, can we have your book for free? And they said, well, why in the world would we give you our book for free? And I said, well, maybe we'll update it, and if we update it, then maybe you can take the updates and publish a new version. And they said, oh, hey, that actually sounds like kind of a fair deal. So they gave us the book. So this is uh, the uh, Repairing and Upgrading Your PC book. Uh, this is massive. There are dozens of uh, wiki pages in here. They are all at least three years out of date. So we're uh, in the process of launching a new uh, community program. So this is more on the Windows PC refurbishment side of things, but if you want to know how to identify CPUs, how to troubleshoot a CPU, there's a tremendous amount of resources in here. Um, and we're really excited. We're going to be releasing this at the beginning of next year. Uh, and this is a good starting point for all of you to start training your technicians, but also the fundamentals are there. It's a little bit out of date, so let's work together. There's an edit button. It shouldn't be that hard to, to bring it up to date with, with what we've learned over the last couple of years. So this is the uh, PC repair uh, manual. And then uh, we've also got a bunch of information on getting going on the Microsoft Registered Refurbisher program, how to get involved. Sean makes it sound easy. It's not quite easy. So <laughs> you, have to, you have to sign up for the program and uh, you take the test and get, get approved. And then you have to go to our, our reseller and get approved with them. And then you order your licenses and then you get them. And the, the beginning to end of signing up for the RRP program, how long did it take you? A About a month. Uh, by the time we said we're going to take the test, we're going to start doing it to when we actually got our first licenses in the mail. Once you get them, they're very low cost. Everything is happy. But it did take us a little bit of the time to get going. It's not, it's not anything crazy hard. You'll be solving much harder problems. It's just not fill out a web form and, and everything is happy. Okay. So that is uh, my overview of uh, the Business School Kit. 